Hello, I, I'm Derry Hannum. Um, I know some of you, but uh, but not all. But um, I'm very, very proud to have this opportunity to participate in the opening conference of your project. And thank you very much to Maggie and Martina for making that possible. Gabriel Guas has talked powerfully about the key beliefs, aims and purposes of the democratic schools movement. So now it's my turn to say a few words about why it is so important for these ideas to be transmitted and translated into our state school systems, and to make some suggestions as to how this could be done. In some ways, I'm embarrassed to be a representative of England, as comparative research shows that children in my country are amongst the unhappiest in the world. We know that home and school are the two biggest influences on the well-being of children and young people, and that agency and autonomy are the key to its improvement. Uh, it's our responsibility as school educators to reduce the contribution of school to this sad situation and to do our best to support parents as well. When I was at primary school, I enjoyed the company of my friends, but I was always anxious about failing to understand and falling behind in lessons, getting low marks in tests, <coughs> not being selected for the grammar school at 11, being bullied because I had red hair. For much of the time I was bored and uninterested in lessons, as well as anxious, as nobody bothered to ask what I was interested in, concerned about, or liked doing, or was good at. My opinion was never asked for, and if I expressed it, I ran the risk of teacher disapproval or punishment. Well, there have been some signs of improvement in my country over the last 70 years, but now I feel sometimes we're going backwards in many of our state schools. They're becoming more stressful, unhappier places for many children and their teachers. I hope this is not true in your countries, but I suspect it might be in some. The fact that the EU has been willing to fund your project is an enormous source of optimism for me and just makes the negativity of Brexit all the harder to live with. Well, when I became a teacher, I was determined to try to do things in another way to listen to the children in my class, to include them in decision-making, to allow and encourage them to bring their interests and concerns to school, to encourage them to ask questions, to follow their own ideas in projects that they felt to be valuable, and to share these ideas with others. When I was at Teachers College, I skipped the lectures that I saw no point in, such as behaviour management based on Pavlov or Skinner. I remember offending the psychology lecturer by saying that I wanted to teach children, not rats or dogs. I discovered the ideas of John Dewey and Tolstoy and Homer Lane, and of course A.S. Neal and his Summerhill School. Well, I had two wonderful experiences in primary schools trying these ideas out, <coughs> and one disaster in a secondary school during my teacher training. The ideas worked, I discovered, in the right environment, but not in the authoritarian secondary school, where I was treated as a dangerous subversive for allowing history classes, for example, to discuss the importance of democracy. Ho -ho! Terrible idea. Well, that seemed a bit strange, I thought, as we'd fought two world wars to defend democracy. Anyway, I was very lucky in my first job as a teacher. I'd been offered jobs in one or two progressive private schools, but partly for political reasons. I believed that we had to try to change the state system, because that was where the kids from poor families like mine were. This first job was in a secondary school after all, but one that tried to smooth the way from primary to secondary by having one teacher for about 60% of curriculum time, to teach English, history, geography, social studies and religious education to a first-year class of 11-year-olds. I had 34 of them, and I was able, with the support of the head teacher, to some extent anyway, to create what I would now describe as a democratic learning community. We introduced a class meeting in a circle with students as chairperson and secretary, New chair people and secretaries were elected for every meeting, so everyone got a turn. They made class laws and enforced them with a class court. 
I was able to ignore much of the official subject curriculum to encourage the children to create projects around their own concerns and interests. In groups, if possible, but on their own if no one else shared their interest. The walls of the classroom soon became covered by the class newspaper, completely controlled by the children, and we had many class clubs, associations, societies, etc., all run by the students. Everyone was responsible for something. It was great fun, and I thought I might get fired, but I didn't, and in my second year, I moved up with my class and was put in charge of all seven classes in the year group. Because this was a secondary modern school, these children had failed an examination at 11, which meant they probably weren't going to get the chance to go to university. And when the parents saw how enthusiastic the kids were becoming about going to school, they became very supportive. And of course, supportive parents keep head teachers happy. And I was able to choose a team of teachers who wanted to work in this democratic way. Some older, more senior teachers thought I was crazy, but we had what I call the three T's, which I think are very important to making our ideas work. Firstly, team. After my first year, I was not alone, but I was working with others and we were able to support each other. The second T is for time. Not just half hour or one hour lessons, but half days or whole days where students could really get involved in things. And then the third T is territory. We had a group of classrooms next door to each other so that children could choose which teacher would help them most. And we kept our classroom doors open to allow kids to move from class to class. What I was not able to do was have mixed age groups, though I did this in my next two schools. When I asked the head teacher if we could mix the first and second years together, he said, no. I've given you enough freedom, Derry, and I can't have 500 kids all wandering around the school at the same time. Well, I've written a book about those days, helped by some of the kids who were in the class, who are now coming up to retirement age. I've reduced the price to two euros for the e-book at Smashwords just for you. It's called Another Way is Possible, Becoming a Democratic Teacher in a State School. Um, the there's a link to the book and to the other papers I'm going to talk about in the text version of this talk, which I hope Maggie can let you have, or, sorry, and Martina can let you have, um, if you want it. If not, I can let you have it. Many teachers in state schools would like to give their students more freedom to pursue their own concerns, interests, questions and purposes in school but they're prevented from doing so by government prescribed curriculum, prescribed testing, prescribed inspection, and the consequent anxieties of head teachers. Now, I and others have been advocating the allocation of 20% of curriculum time to such a self-directed program in all state schools. 20%, yes, one day a week. Well, it's a start. The process of negotiating how to implement and manage such a program creates a powerful agenda for student participation in school governance and school decision making. It's quite common for student councils to exist in state schools, but it's also quite common for these to be regarded rightly as ineffective and tokenistic by the students themselves. This is less true in some of the Nordic countries where there are long-established traditions of student involvement in policy-making at school and national level. But even in Norway and Denmark, student leaders in their national school student organisations complain of student apathy in some schools, especially where head teachers don't listen to the students. The situation, of course, is quite different in the democratic schools. I've visited hundreds of them now around the world. Here it is normal for students to pursue their own interests, make choices about their learning, as well as participating on equal terms with the adults in matters of school governance, rulemaking, rule enforcing, etc. There are many different ways of doing this, of course, and I'm sure that the democratic schools in your project are not all the same. Participation in rule enforcement, as well as rule creation, democratic decision making, 
and a substantial degree of self-directed and self-managed learning. These will be common to all the schools in the project, I'm sure the democratic schools, but there might be differences around lesson schedules, for example, which exist at Summerhill type schools, although attendance at the lessons is not compulsory. On the other hand, at Sudbury Valley model schools, lessons only occur when requested by students. Another model might have a hybrid arrangement, such as Hadira School in Israel or Sand School in England. Some might have a sociocratic rather than a majoritarian approach to decision making, as is to be found in some of the Dutch democratic schools. It will be fascinating to see the expertise gained in your project democratic schools with their various approaches to learning and governance being shared with each other as well as with their state school participants. It will be equally fascinating to hear about the developments in the state schools and what they're already doing that has led to them to choose to be participants in this project. A very brave decision and great that you want to come and work together with the democratic schools. That's wonderful. The journey of the state schools is a tough one as they have to navigate the voyage to greater freedom for their students in the face of not always sympathetic official bureaucracies and inspectorates. I'm sure that the state schools in the project will have a lot to learn from each other, as well as from their partner democratic schools and the democratic schools collectively. There have been moments in my career as a state school teacher, deputy principal, school inspector, consultant in school democracy for the Council of Europe, etc., etc., when I've had the opportunity to influence policy around student participation, school democracy, to influence policy at international, national and local levels. I think it's very important that we're opportunistic in this, that we're always looking for opportunities to extend the opportunities for students to participate in decision making about their learning and the management of the school. And some 20 years ago, I was involved in the creation of the Council of Europe Initiative, Education for a Democratic Society, Human Rights Education, EDC stroke HRE. A core principle was established right from the start that young people should participate in decisions about their learning and the democratic management of the schools of the member states as required by Article 12 of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. It didn't happen in every school, of course. We ran courses in school democracy for state school teachers, mainly from the ex-communist countries in Eastern Europe. I was supported by teachers and young people from Nordic countries such as Norway, Denmark and Finland, where school student organisations were well established. This work is continuing today, led by the team at the Vergeland Centre in Oslo. This led to my involvement in the introduction of citizenship education into the English national curriculum. From the start, we established the idea that for young people to learn deeply about democracy, they had to do it in schools and not just listen to teachers talk about it. All students aged 14 to 16 in English state schools were required to participate in democratic decision making and responsible action in their schools and the wider community. Well, the innovation, which lasted for 10 years, by the way, until the Conservative Party abolished it, but the idea was attacked by the right wing press as a waste of precious learning time. The minister asked me, have we got any research to support what we're doing? Well, the answer was no, I couldn't find any. So I made my own research. We conducted our own inquiry. What we found was that schools that were more democratic and participative than average actually got better results than average when compared to all schools in similar socioeconomic environments. Examination results were higher, attendance was better, and fewer students were excluded for antisocial behaviour. I collected many examples of ways in which these more progressive state schools 
were able to involve their students in school democracy. And I think some of these examples may be useful during your project. The report that I wrote had a long, pompous official name that became known as the Hannam Report. It's still available online in several languages, and you might find it interesting as your project unfolds. I've put links to, uh, to my report uh, in the text. A couple of years later, we were able to get the law in England changed to permit state schools that wish to do it to elect students to their governing boards. I also wrote a report about this, and there's a link in the text. What we found was when students, when young people are involved in uh, school board decision making, the boards made better decisions. And this was the opinion of the adults, not just the young people. A few years later, I worked with a team from Sussex University to create student councils in all the primary and secondary state schools in the city of Portsmouth. These councils then created a city-wide council called COPS and it began to negotiate education policy with the local government of the city. It still exists and has continued to develop for 16 years now. It has morphed into a successful not-for-profit consultancy known as Unlock, which employs a dozen or so young people and some not so young, encouraging and developing participative approaches, not just in schools and colleges, but also um, in businesses in England and in several other countries. Their website is well worth exploring. Again, as um, a link in the text. It's very, very encouraging that the Erasmus Plus decision makers have allowed this DESC project to proceed. It could produce powerful examples, case studies and models for change that will have wide effects, not just on the participating schools themselves, but also on the school systems of your countries and maybe of Europe as a whole. It's a big task and a big responsibility for you all, but you are not alone. I know that both at the EU and the Council of Europe, at UNESCO and even the World Economic Forum, there are people in high places who know that many state education systems are failing. Even Mr Pisa himself, Andreas Schleicher of the OECD, says that we're producing robots instead of the creatives who are needed for species survival. But they're unsure how to proceed which is why this project is so important. These people also exist in some ministries of education. They know that most state school systems are failing to foster the flourishing and well-being of many, many of their young people. And yet at the same time, we're also failing to provide the innovators required by the employers and entrepreneurs of the fourth industrial revolution. We're failing kids in personal terms and in terms of future employment. These obsolete schooling systems are suppressing the very qualities that the world needs to face the crises of climate change, xenophobia and inequality. The C words that we are becoming familiar with from psychologists such as Jerome Bruner and Peter Gray, the C words, curiosity, creativity, collaboration, competence, communication, to which we should add Peter Gray's famous P word, playfulness. These qualities have evolved over millions of years, yet in just a couple of centuries, we've allowed our industrial factory schooling to suppress them. It seems to me that the resurrection and dissemination of these seas is what this DESC project is all about. I'm very optimistic about the work that you're going to be doing, and it's wonderful to be a part of it with you all. I'm sorry not to be with you in person, but I surely will be the next time you meet. Deo Berlenti. Well, let the listening, learning and sharing begin. And thank you very much for listening.